So today what we're going to cover is sort of uh, a broad overview of our sort of relationship to the, ana to the microbial world, what the role of antibiotics is, and then some things that you can do uh, to sort of uh, help um, yourself in terms of your coexistence with the, with the microbial world. And so we're going to go on a little bit of a journey. And uh, our journey is going to start with essentially with ourselves uh, and examining the world of microbes that's present from on from the humblest to us to sort of the most, uh, well, I'm not sure how you want to characterize these people. That's totally up to you. But, uh, you know, even Barack has a little bit of Staphylococcus epidermidis on his cheek. Uh, and so one, the place where we're going to start is looking at our own microbial flora and how we coexist with the bacteria that are in and around us. But then we're going to take a really long step out and we're going to look at infectious diseases uh, in the world as a whole. And we're going to talk about some of the new infections that have become uh, more of an issue as globalization has sort of shrunk uh, the size of the world, essentially. But then we're also just going to focus on really our own backyard, because that's where most of the risk to you is. Even though you, know, you hear all these things in the news and there's concern over these emerging infectious diseases, most of the things that are likely to kill you as a person in, in, as an, with an infection are the things that are you know, very commonplace. So we're going to talk about the microbial world inside and around us, whether they're pathogens, partners, or both. We'll talk a little bit about why infections happen, and we'll kind of take it from the perspective of some of these reasons why uh, infections occur, the breakdown of barriers, the presence of bad bugs, and then these depleted defenses. And then we're going to kind of go on a little bit of a tour uh, of infections from some sort of exotic places uh, to your own backyard, and then uh, especially focusing on uh, which should concern you and what you can do. And as we go along, feel, please feel free to stop me to ask questions. I think there'll be a lot of points where we can have a dis good discussion, so don't hesitate uh, to stop. Um, there'll be a few sort of more, uh, th I'll stop a few times on purpose, okay? But if there's something that you have a question for that you want to ask immediately, go ahead and ask. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to talk about is the world on around us. And so if you're one of those people that carries around the antibiotic hand uh, washing stuff all the time and you buy the antibiotic impregnated everything, and then you, know, you might want to close your ears for the next few minutes because uh, this may alarm you a little bit, but you are surrounded. Basically, almost every part of you that can contact the outside environment has bacteria present almost all of the time. And so this is just uh, an illustration of the different bacteria that are present on different parts of your body. Okay? So if we take kind of a closer look, just looking at something like the, uh, your mouth and oropharynx, okay? so your mouth and back of your throat, there's a huge variety of bacteria that are there, again, just sort of a normal day-to-day. -day. So you look at, there's 15 organisms here that can be common, uh, what we call colonizers of the respiratory tract. That is, they sort of live there, they don't necessarily cause any problems as long as they're kind of kept in their place. Okay. You were also, unfortunately, outnumbered. So there are 10 trillion human cells in the human body, but at any given time, there are 10 to the 14th, so 10, 1,000, 100 trillion, bacterial cells on and in your body. Obviously, your cells are bigger, so you kind of, there's more of you than them, but it all depends on how you look at it. So to some extent, what the view is sort of changing in terms of that these bacteria are kind of along for the ride to the idea that, you know, you kind of make up an organism with these bacteria and that in some sense, you're sort of a bacteria-human hybrid and that uh, that that's even okay, okay, because that's how it's been throughout history and it's only been recently that we've sort of come to appreciate and they're also not going away. So even if you wanted to you know, live out the germaphobe's dream and completely sterilize yourself, you couldn't. You could take the broadest spectrum antibiotics, you could take a bath in disinfectant, and the bacteria would come back. So they're not going anywhere. Not only that, but certain infections actually, once you have them, you have them for life. They become what we call latent, and they're essentially, you become part of your body. They're never cleared. The classic illustration of this is chickenpox, right? So here's a little kid with chicken pox, okay? And this, is, you get this infection when you're a child, most commonly, and then it goes away, but it actually never really goes away. It goes and hides in your nerve cells, 
And for most people, it just stays there the rest of your life and never causes any problems. But for certain people under certain conditions, especially stress, or if you're becoming uh, immunosuppressed or something like that, it reemerges. And when it reemerges, we call it shingles, okay, or herpes zoster. It's the same virus that causes chicken pox, okay, we call it the varicella zoster virus, but when it has a particular manifestation the first time it infects you with this chicken pox. But then later on in life, if the virus emerges again, it has a different manifestation that we call shingles. Okay. So there's all this, but it's okay. Okay. So bacteria have co-evolved with humans. Okay. It's not as if you know, bacteria have just started to infect people recently. From you know, the time that we evolved into humans, there's been a bacterial flora that's been with us. Okay. And so not only is it okay, but it's increasingly recognized that bacteria may actually play an important role in normal human development and function. So one role of bacteria is that uh, bacteria in the gut actually metabolize certain carbohydrates and other nutrients uh, in a way to make them available to our body in a way that we can't ourselves. So as an illustration, there was an experiment. They, they took rats and they raised them in a germ-free environment. So, they delivered the rats via cesarean sections, and then they kept the rats in a completely sterile environment. And when they compared them to other rats, it actually took more food to get the, to have the sterile rats, which reached the same weight as their compatriots that uh, were colonized with bacteria, okay? Because of the role that the bacteria play in helping us access some of the nutrients from our diet that we wouldn't otherwise be able to access. Another important role they play is in the synthesis uh, and supply of uh, essential vitamins. So especially B and K vitamins, many of them are synthesized by the bacteria or the bacteria act on them in our diet such a way that we can absorb them. And so again, uh, another example in mice, because it's not nice to do this to humans, um, germ-free rice mice that ate sterilized food, so the food they were given was sterilized as well, uh, had a high incidence of dying of uh, vitamin deficiencies, particularly vitamin K, because the bacteria weren't around to supply the levels that they needed in their diet. So th that, though the role of uh, bacteria in nutrition has actually been known for a while, but what's emerging now is the role of bacteria actually interacting with our immune system. So one thing that's important is that the, the normal flora, so again, what I call these colonizing bacteria that are there on you pretty much all the time, provide an important defense, actually, because they crowd out the sort of nastier, meaner bacteria, okay? So bacteria, just like you know, everything else in the environment, all the living things are in competition for resources. They're in competition for food, for space, et cetera. And so the bacteria that you have living on you that you know, are what we call the commensal or the colonizing bacteria, Essentially, when they're there, they crowd out the uh, bacteria that could cause you harm, okay? So the number of bacteria, for example, that is needed to establish an infection, okay? So if you uh, had a mouse or something like that and you were trying to infect it with a bacteria, say by feeding it a bacteria or something, it's 10,000 times lower. So you need 10,000 times less bacteria to cause an infection, okay, if you've treated the mouse beforehand with antibiotics. So if you've given the mouse antibiotics to kill off some of these normal healthy bacteria that are living in the mouse, then it takes much less of the potentially pathogenic bacteria to establish an infection. And one thing that's been uh, particularly interesting to find a, to a area of research is that exposure to these sort of colonizing flora, the bacteria that are with you essentially from the time that you're born, may help train the immune system and sort of prevent autoimmune and allergic disease. And this has been called uh, the hygiene hypothesis or the New England Journal of Medicine called it sort of eat dirt, okay? The idea is that um, by being exposed to these organisms in your environment, your uh, immune system no starts to learn to, to distinguish between non-self, so these pathogens, and self. And that without that stimulation from these other uh, organisms, that you may see uh, more autoimmune type of diseases because your immune system is no longer properly trained. And part of this has risen through um, observations that over time, as the number of infections has decreased through vaccination, sanitation, use of antibiotics, 
we've actually seen a huge increase in the incidence of immune disorders. So you can see the graph uh, on the left here shows the incidence of uh, infectious diseases decreasing substantially, and then the graph on the right shows the increase in the incidence of immunologic type diseases. And some of that's due to the fact that people are living longer, and some of it's due to the fact that people have, uh, you know, we have more better diagnostic tools, but it's thought that some of it may be to the, due to the fact that we're living in more clean, more sterile environments, and that we're no longer being sort of challenged with bacteria the way we were, uh, you know, 100 years ago, and that that may have some immunologic consequences. And this is certainly not very well flushed out yet, and so I don't necessarily advise going and rolling your kid in the dirt or not getting them vaccinated, um, because that would be bad. There's a risk to that, but that uh, there may be something to this after all. So what goes wrong? If we're, we love our bacteria and we walk hand in hand them down the beach and it's so great to have them, uh, why are infections such a problem? Um, I mean, historically, infectious diseases have been the leading cause of death throughout history. And it's only really recently that infections have gone from being the leading cause of death to uh, being subsumed by things like cardiovascular disease and cancer. And you can see the graph, and that's just in the United States, um, really a su substantial reduction in infectious diseases um, and an increase in uh, other diseases. But, you know, throughout history, infections have been a huge issue. So why is it that uh, if it's so great to have these normal colonizing bacteria, what goes wrong and why do we get infections? And I like to think about it as sort of being an equilibrium and trying to think of things that upset the equilibrium uh, and some of the issues that we'll talk about uh, next. So one is the idea of sort of breakdown of barriers. And I'm not sure how you can, well, you can see that, but it's basically just a cut. And just symbolizing the idea that sort of at a micro or at a person level, okay, one way that infections happen is that bacteria uh, leave their normal compartments. So there are bacteria that are all over your skin, and as long as you're on, they're on your skin, they're fine. But it's when they get places where they don't belong, when you get a cut and they get into your bloodstream, they get into your tissue, when the bacteria that normally live in your gut get into your urinary tract, that's where they start to cause problems. And so everything likes to have its own little environment, but when it's transferred to a different environment, that may be when you start to see uh, real issues in terms of what we would consider an actual infection rather than just colonization. You can also think about this as sort of a kind of a more macro level. And one way we can consider sort of a breaking down of barriers is the idea of organisms crossing species into new hosts. So we have our own you know, normal flora, bacteria that live on us. But if we get an organism that is normally is part of the normal flora of another organism, we may not be happy with that. We haven't co-evolved with those bacteria in order to reach some sort of equilibrium. And so that's where we may see some infection. So as an example, the hantavirus uh, infects these deer mouse here, mice here. So you may recall hantavirus is intermittently in the news, primarily in the southwest US, is causing uh, respiratory disease, especially in young, healthy people. Uh, and it's uh, excreted in the droppings in the urine of these mice, but it doesn't cause disease to the mice at all. It only causes disease when it gets into humans. Okay. So here what we have is a crossing of the species barrier, and our immune system isn't really uh, evolved to handle some of these pathogens. So a lot of infections arise when uh, we get uh, organisms that come from one species to another. Another way that we can think about the equilibrium uh, breaking down is this idea of the acquisition of virulence. And virulence is essentially uh, how much damage a particular organism causes. So some organisms are highly virulent. They tend to cause a lot of damage. And some organisms have less virulence. And what you can see is that uh, different strains of the same organism can cause uh, different infections. They can have different levels of virulence. Okay. So for example, um, you, you've probably heard in the media about the flesh-eating bacteria, which makes it sound as if it's something like from outer space and that, that comes and causes these horrible infections. But it's actually not anything unusual. It's most commonly one of the organisms that's a resident of your skin and respiratory tract. But not all uh, of these bacteria are created equal. Some of them have these what we call virulence factors that cause some of this damage, and most of the organisms don't. So it could be that it's a common organism, but that particular bug, that particular clone of those organisms, they bring virulence factors that then cause infection. 
you can kind of think about this as a, at a macro level too, so not just an individual patient acquiring a new strain, virulent strain of an organism, but you can think about a virulent strain spreading. So there's a particular organism that causes um, diarrhea and can cause severe gastrointestinal infections, and it uh, appears to have evolved to, uh, that there's a particular strain that produces a toxin that's hypervirulent, so it causes a huge amount of disease and that this hypervirulent strain has been spreading. And so this is just an example of how uh, it started essentially in the Northeast in Canada, but the organism has also been spreading. So what you're seeing is you see a replacement of the normal organism with a more hypervirulent one, and this happens on occasion. And then finally, you know, one of the uh, problems is a failure of host defenses. And so the picture is a picture of a patient with um, thrush, so some of you may have seen this. It's not. Uh, it's. It can happen in children and uh, elderly adults, and it doesn't necessarily mean a patient has a high degree of immunosuppression. But it's uh, an infection that's caused by an organism that's normally present in your gastrointestinal tract and even on your skin. So candida uh, is the organism. It's actually a yeast. But if patients have immune deficiencies then this organism goes from, again, leaving in sort of equilibrium to growing up and actually causing uh, an infection. So defects or deficiency in the immune system are one of the main ways where organisms uh, cause actual disease. And this is essentially a failure of our host defenses. Uh, certainly, the HIV AIDS epidemic is sort of the most, um, the strongest example lately of that. You can also have patients who have inherited immunodeficiencies um, where they have defects in their uh, host defenses. But a lot of these issues with failures of host defenses are things that we've, in, we've done to ourselves. Um, so transplantation and the subsequent immunosuppression that's necessary to prevent the person from rejecting their own organ okay, is a main cause of um, failure of host defenses. Things like chemotherapy, you know, again, that aim to kill your tumor, but also usually end up causing some degree of immunosuppression. Uh, things like corticosteroids, which may be very helpful for you for certain immunologic diseases, arthritis, and other things, but they have an effect of suppressing the immune system, and so they can put you at risk as well. Uh, and then even sort of more commonplace things. So diabetes uh, can cause a certain degree of immunosuppression. So patients will, who are diabetic uh, are at increased risk of having certain infections. And then even more mundane things like stress. So we talked about earlier, we talked about um, patients getting shingles. And so you can get shingles just because it's a very stressful time in your life. And stress can actually be a suppressor of the immune system. Well, so in terms of, you know, thinking about the failure of host defenses at sort of a macro level, uh, I think one way that I, I'd characterize this is, is some of the issues that we have with antimicrobial resistance. So antibiotics are really our sort of our shared resource. They're our shared defense uh, against organisms causing infections. You know, when our own body's defenses break down, we bring in antibiotics. Um, but one thing that is a potential failure of antibiotics is the development of antibiotic resistance. And so I think that that's an important consideration because antibiotics are, you know, again, a recent phenomenon in terms of human use, but they're something that we've become reliant on to augment our own health defenses. And certain things that we do in medicine now, especially things like transplant, would not be uh, feasible if we didn't have antibiotics because they cause such, because the procedures cause such damage to the immune system that if we didn't have something uh, handy to fight off infections as they occur, you know, a lot of these transplants, a lot of chemotherapy really wouldn't be feasible because people would die of infection. Okay, so now we're going to go on a little bit of a tour uh, of some of the infectious diseases, threats to your health. And I think one thing that I, I like to do is I like to... Um, well, I like to watch TV, and especially like to see the perspective that um, uh, sort of the entertainment industry and the news uh, outlets have on infectious diseases. So we'll talk about some of them, and I'll uh, do some of those presentations. Let me turn this on. Let me know if it's too, let me know if it gets too loud. You look sick. I feel sick. But you should feel relaxed. You just got back from a long vacation. Hey, kids, what's going on? He's sick. <laughs> and he just got back from a long vacation. Oh, really, Bird? Where did you go? 
I was visiting my relatives in Southeast Asia. Whoa. Whoa, whoa, wait, wait a minute, bird. You might have the bird flu. The bird flu? What's that? Avian influenza virus genus A. It's the most potentially devastating disease. Avian influenza virus genus A. It could bring the human race to its knees. It starts off as a tickle in the back of your throat. Next you're dead and buried. Bye bye, that's all she wrote. Avian influenza virus genus A. It's the most terrific death you could endure. It's contagious and to this date it has no cure. So while I don't generally recommend that you get your information about infectious diseases through parodies of children's shows, that was actually a relatively decent characterization, although it lacks a lot of detail, of the bird flu, or as we call it, uh, highly pathogenic avian influenza. And so I want to talk about that a little bit because it's certainly something that's been in the news intermittently and it kind of comes and goes. And so you wonder, you know, one day it seems like bird flu is right around the corner and the next thing, you know, no one's talked about it for six months. So what is it and what is the real threat that there is to us? So first I'll just talk a little bit about influenza in general. So influenza is caused by a virus, the influenza virus, and it's a family of respiratory viruses that infect uh, various vertebrate. Uh, so this can infect humans, pigs, uh, waterfowl, so things like ducks. There are actually three main types of human influenza viruses. A is the most common, B is relatively common, uh, and C is extremely rare. One thing that's important uh, is that you'll hear vi these viruses referred to by different names. Uh, and so I just want to give you a brief introduction to what those mean. So what these are is the, they're, again, what we call virulence factors. So they're characteristics of the organism that help it to cause disease. And so in this case, there are a couple of them for influenza. One is called hemagglutinin, and so it's abbreviated with an H. And then the axes, there are different hemagglutinin proteins. And so those different proteins get a number. So the hemagglutinin allows for binding to the respiratory mucosa, so it allows it to set up shop uh, in your respiratory tract. There's another protein called neuraminidase, I abbreviate it as M, and, and, and this allows for viral spread. So the virus infects some of your cells in your respiratory tract, and then it needs to leave those cells to go infect other cells, and it does that through the use of this neuraminidase protein. And so these virulence factors are used to type influenza viruses. So for example, the current vaccine contains components against H3N2, so that's a particular combination of uh, hemagglutinin and neuraminidase proteins, the H1H1, or excuse me, H1N1, and those are both influenza A viruses, and then influenza B, which doesn't have the same typing system. So one thing that's important to understand about influenza is this idea that there's gen genetic variation. And one type of genetic variation in influenza is called antigenic drift. And these are yearly changes that occur, and they're very minor changes that occur in the viral components, okay, especially the hemagglutinin and the neuraminidase, due to sort of random evolutionary pressures. So there's influenza virus all over the world all the time, uh, and it goes around, and as it sort of spread throughout the world, there are different, you know, evolutionary things, random assortment, mutation, et cetera, and so that gives rise to these minor changes. So human antibodies that we've developed to the influenza virus um, bind these changed viral antigens weakly, okay? So this is the reason why you have to get a different flu shot every year is because there, there's this antigenic drift and the viruses change a little bit. Now, one thing is you may hear is that even when the, the, the vaccine is not what we call a perfect match, when the antigens are not perfect, then the vaccine may still provide some protection, okay? And that's because there's still some components of the influenza virus that are common, even to the newly mutated viruses. So that's sort of illustrated here, the idea that some of your antibodies bind to these parts here, which are the parts that can change, but then some antibodies bind to these common portions, okay? So antigenic drift occurs, and these antigens here that some of these antibodies bind to change, and so they no longer bind, but there's still parts of the influenza virus that are more or less the same. So you can still get some protection um, from the influenza virus, even if it's not a perfect match for the circulating um, strain. 
So one headline that you may have heard is that this season the flu strains are not a good match for vaccine. And so these are the, so every year's flu vaccine has three components. Typically it's two A strains and one B strain. And so there's the H1N1 and an H3N2. But even within the H1N1 family, there are other minor differences, and so they're characterized by where they were essentially first characterized, and then the date and the time and such. But the circulating strains that are going around the northern hemisphere this flu season include these two other strains for which there isn't good protection. So essentially, we just sort of guessed wrong. And sometimes this happens, okay, because you have to make up the flu vaccine so the flu vaccines, you know, for the flu season, like November through March or whatever, are made up months in advance. And you have to know which strains are going to go into that flu vaccine. And you do it essentially by trying to monitor influenza, vac uh, you know, influenza activity over the whole world. But sometimes the strains that you think are going to end up causing infection uh, during flu season uh, are not the ones that are the primary ones. So these ones are still around, but there's a lot more of this than we'd normally be uh, seeing and a lot more of this. And so that's why there are uh, not a good match necessarily. Okay, so let's talk about one other thing uh, in terms of genetics, which is a different concept called antigenic shift, as opposed to this drift that kind of happens uh, occasionally. There, these are infrequent major changes in the viral components due to, uh, for example, recombination events. So two different viruses get together and sort of do their viral mating thing, kind of, uh, and then they end up with essentially a hybrid, okay? So what happens in these cases is that human antibodies don't recognize these viral antigens at all. And so you have no memory immune spot response. So before, we talked about, you know, you have different antibodies that bind to different parts. But what happens with during these recombination events, so for example, a human influenza and influenza from, say, a pig, they get together and their antigens, essentially all their antigens change. And your body essentially ne doesn't see it as any kind of influenza not even, you know, a part, uh, an influenza strain that has a little bit of immunity to. And this is what's responsible for influenza pandemics. So there have been a number of pandemics throughout history. So this is essentially a worldwide um, uh, pattern of infection where humans don't have uh, an established amount of immunity, and so uh, a large amount of illness and death occur. So the biggest one was in 1918 and we'll talk more about that. That was with an H1N1 strain. And then what happened is, so here was H1N1. And so it was introduced from presumably a duck or some sort of um, non-human mammal, animal, uh, and, it, and it became the cause of the Spanish influenza. But then years later, a different strain was introduced into the human population that again, we didn't have any pre-existing immunity to the H2N2 strain, and that caused another pandemic. And then later, the H3N2 strain came into circulation, okay, again from an animal, and caused another pandemic. Now, the H3N2 strain caused a pandemic. It went all the way around the world, and it killed a lot of people. But the people that it didn't kill developed some amount of sort of normal immunity to it. So now there's H3N2 circulating, and we have to worry about the antigenic drift, right, the fact that it changes a little bit every season but we don't have to worry about the fact that it made this huge jump, okay? And somehow the H1N strain kind of, it caused the, this major pandemic and then it sort of petered out and then it kind of came back into the population a little bit. Okay, and why are we concerned with influenza pandemics? Well, this is a life expectancy in the United States over the last essentially 100 years and throughout all sorts of things, wars, okay, and you know, World War II, the by far, the biggest effect on life expectancy was the 1918 influenza pandemic. So nothing even came close to having an effect on life expectancy that the influenza pandemic had. And so this is one of the reasons why there's a huge amount of concern about the potential of another influenza pandemic that's as bad as the Spanish flu. So remember, there were other pandemics in other years, but they didn't make that much, to have that much of an effect. And what was different about the influenza pandemic, beyond its lethality, was the pattern by which it killed people. So the dotted line here essentially represent is the, the previous years before the 1918 pandemic, and essentially this is kind of the normal pattern. And what this is, is the death rate by age. So who does sort of normal influenza kill? It kills the very young and the very old. Okay, so mortality is highest at these ends. But the 1918 pandemic strain killed the very young, the very old, 
and young, healthy people in the middle. Okay? And so that is a really big concern is that uh, you're going to see this altered pattern of uh, mortality in these new pandemics. So again, these, the, the reason we're worried about the bird flu in the context of these pandemics is that there are influenza A viruses that occur naturally in birds, is what we're concerned about, and they have some of these antigens that haven't been in humans before. So H5, okay, a hemagglutinin and type 5 antigen doesn't normally circulate in humans, so we have no degree of immunity to it. There are other ones as well, H7, H9, and then, like, for example, N7. And so the concern is that some of these uh, organisms uh, with these new antigens can make their way into humans. Okay, and so these normally affect infect the birds, and they you know the birds shed the virus, so they excrete the virus in their feces, their saliva, and then whatever a bird nasal secretion is. Um, and there are birds that the wild birds generally don't get sick with it. So one question is, well, why doesn't it just kill off all the birds? And you don't have to worry about it. The, the wild birds can be hosts to it and not get disease, although the um, domesticated birds, like the chickens, et cetera, uh, can be killed. And so that's where you also hear the big effect of uh, bird flu on, you know, on poultry stocks and stuff like that. Um, the, the sort of saving grace at this point about uh, bird flu, highly pathogenic avian influenza, is that it's very poorly adapted to, um, for transmission to and between humans. So it actually kind of takes a lot in order to get a person infected with one of these bird flu viruses. Okay. Most cases currently result, result from direct exposure to sick fowl. Okay. So these are the kind of things where, you know, in a lot of these countries, um, people live in co close proximity um, to their feed animals. Uh, and so they're, you know, chickens in the backyard and people go and slaughter them themselves. And if chickens are sick, you know, they don't want to go kill their whole flock of them because that's an important economic resource. It has been shown that there have been some cases that are demonstrated among very close contacts for which a subsequent exposure to the chickens or whatever hasn't been established. So there's probably some amount of transmission between humans, okay? but at this point it appears to be limited to people with very close contacts. Okay? So it's not the sort of thing where you just get in an elevator and you sneeze and everybody gets the bird flu. You probably need to spend a prolonged amount of time in contact with those people. But the reason why we're really concerned is because the, the degree of diseases it causes, causes currently is profound. So the case fatality rate, the number of people that die from those who are infected is very high. So anywhere from 30 to 90% of people who have a proven case. Now one thing that complicates this is that it's not like we're going around Southeast Asia testing every person to see whether or not they've been exposed to the bird flu. Some people may have been infected but never developed symptoms. But because they don't develop symptoms, we're not going to know that. So right now, we just have estimates of how many people are going to die based on how many people get really sick and symptomatic. So uh, what's sort of been hypothesized that part of that may be due to uh, essentially an overimmune response, that you know, when you're actually young and healthy and your body's exposed to this virus, maybe your immune system just goes haywire and your immune system essentially you know, overreacts and that's what kills you. But it's currently not clear uh, at least to me, I'm not an influenza researcher, but from my understanding of the, of the literature, that you know that's still not really well explained. So the, again, the reason that we're concerned about highly pathogenic avian influenza is because it could be the source of the next pandemic. So right now, bird flu is not it's not pandemic, right? I mean, it just occurs in isolated cases, but there's a potential that it could become uh, the pan next pandemic virus. So what could happen? if the organism, you know, what's the sort of future of bird flu? Um, well, one could be that it was just sort of the equilibrium that it's existing in right now is that it never becomes well adapted to human, for human to human transmission. So people uh, don't really spread it to each other. And in this case, it essentially would become an occupational hazard, right, for poultry workers. They would probably still be at risk. We're probably not going to be ever able to eradicate the virus itself. We can't go out and kill every chicken and every duck just to get rid of it. So it'll be there in nature, but it may just be that the risk is to the people who are exposed. Another scenario is that it becomes adapted for human transmission, but that we manage essentially to sort of nip it in the bud. Uh, and one way is that we can slow the spread through uh, well, like someone had mentioned, good infection control and quarantine measures. And an example that we'll talk about in a second is something, another disease that was in and out of the news, SARS. Antivirals, uh, if they are effective for the treatment and prevention, and if we have enough on hand, that may help to sort of limit the spread and the damage. 
and if we can produce a well-matched vaccine. The current influenza virus vaccine that you get, everybody's gotten for uh, just seasonal influenza, does not provide a substantial degree of protection. So you need to create essentially an entirely new vaccine. And there is research on doing that. Okay? And some of these are sort of experimental vaccines are starting to roll off the line. But it's unclear you know, how effective it will be because you can't experimentally infect people. So everybody remembers from a few years ago, the other sort of scare that involved a virus that spread, SARS. You know, it was made the cover of Newsweek. People everywhere in China was wearing a mask. Instead of a, you know, a duck, the villain was this thing here. This is a civet cat, which is one of the um, sort of exotic uh, mammals in uh, China that are thought to be perhaps the source of it. Um, and it spread throughout the world as well. There were cases in the United States, Canada, Brazil, as well as its origin. But essentially through uh, good uh, infection control, through closing down these markets where these um, uh, uh, potential hosts were sold, we managed essentially to contain SARS. So the question is, if highly pathogenic avian influenza became to some extent more transmissible, could we contain it? It's not clear, but there's the potential. And then there's the sort of scenario that everyone's worried about, that the highly pathogenic avian influenza becomes a data of human transmission and spreads, and our countermeasures are not adequate. So there is a concern that there may be resistance to our antiviral drugs in these strains. And if that happens, then we've lost those. Um, if we don't get a vaccine developed or we don't deliver it in time, we may not be able to limit the spread. What we would see would be high United States and global mortality. So like you mentioned, the number of deaths in 1918, these are different scenarios that um, the CDC has worked out. And for a sort of a 1918 type of pathogenicity, we could see 1.8 million deaths just the United States. You'd see a collapse of global healthcare systems like we talked about, not enough ventilators, hospitals are overflowing, uh, and then global economic disruption, certainly. Uh, and there are contingency plans for this sort of thing. So the CDC has uh, different, uh, what would they call a pandemic severity index in terms of how lethal the virus would be and how many people would likely die if there was a pandemic. And some of the measures that they recommend, if especially for the most dangerous viruses, are pretty severe. So you see things like uh, voluntary isolation of ill people at home. So if at some point the hospitals become overwhelmed, you just keep people at home because there's no point in sending them to the hospital and getting them to infect other people. Voluntary quarantine of contacts of household members that are infected. So your kid is sick. Okay. You may become infected and spread it to others, so it's recommended that you stay out of contact. What the, this thing they call social distancing, uh, and for children this would be kids don't go to school because it's not you know, reasonable for them to aggregate in one place. And then for adults, you know, work, community, can you have meetings, can you go to work? These are all things that are, you know, for the worst case scenario, things that are being talked about. And this certainly would be a huge disruption to our lifestyle. Okay, so what can you do? Uh, unless you have a, you know, a flu vaccine brewing in your backyard, what, you know, what else can you do? Well, you can stay informed. And so there's a website uh, that they have specifically to address pandemic flu. Um, you can pr pr uh, promote preparedness at home at work and at work. So you know, there are things that you can consider. You know, think about what the scenarios would be. How would your life change? How would your work change if something like this occurred? Just get used to practicing good hygiene, you know, washing your hands, covering your coughs, and staying home when you're sick. Even for, you know, if you don't have the bird flu, it's best not to come to work, not to infect other people if you can avoid it. And I know there's a lot of pressures to, to you know, not be able to do that, but it's usually what's recommended. To support efforts to increase sort of our surge capacity in our hospitals and healthcare systems. So like we talked about, you know, if there was a, a pandemic, it's going to be a really big problem. Even when it's just normal flu season here, we're stretched to our limits. And if anything beyond that occurred, um, there'd be a big problem. Of course, the issue then is if the pandemic never comes, you got all these you know, extra hospital beds or whatever. But I think it's best to be prepared. One thing don't, don't do is don't get your hands on a bunch of antiviral drugs and keep them in your cabinet. Okay? Uh, for one thing, they, you know, they can probably be used by other people. Uh, for another, they'll go bad and expire. And for a third, you know, one thing that's going to happen, if there's any rumor of the bird flu going around, anybody that has these antiviral drugs at home, they're going to take it the first time they get a cold, and they're essentially just going to blow it, right? Because they're going to want to take it at the first onset of symptoms. And you know, there's a whole lot of things that look like influenza to begin with. And so 
you know, it's not recommended that you essentially stockpile the medications for yourself. Okay, so, but who should have your attention more? Birdzilla, the flu-ridden destroyer of nations, bringer of the bird flu, or this guy, this actor, Peter Gallagher from the OC. I'm not sure how familiar you guys are with that very quality show. But I'll actually make an argument that the um, person you should probably be paying attention to is uh, Mr. Peter Gallagher. Peter Gallagher, theater, film, and television actor, lost his grandmother to influenza. My grandmother died from the flu when my dad was about seven years old. And uh, I think, you know, whenever you lose a parent, for whatever reason at that age, it has a pr profound impact on your life. And I, it just always stayed with me that something that we kind of didn't really understand was very dangerous when I was growing up was in fact fatal. We'll be viewing the Faces of Influenza Portrait Gallery and speaking with public officials about the importance of an influenza vaccination for those under six years of age and those over 50. The Portrait Gallery, which is touring the United States, includes black and white portraits and personal stories of famous and not so famous Americans who should be immunized. So I've just spent the last half hour or so trying to scare you about pandemic influenza. But what you should really be concerned about is regular old seasonal influenza because you're much more likely in your lifetime to get infected with seasonal influenza. So every year in the US, 10 to 20% of people get the flu. Some people say, well, I always get the flu. Um, well, you're really unlucky. Um, greater than 200,000 people are hospitalized for complications from regular influenza, and about 35,000 people die. And so you can see, here it comes every year. So every year we have the flu. And some years are worse than others. So here's an example illustration of what we call the epidemic threshold, okay, when the amount of flu exceeds what we normally expect. So this kind of black curve is sort of what we normally expect, and then some years it's worse than others. You know, a long time ago, your mother would tell you, don't go out without a sweater because you'll catch the cold and you'll catch the flu. And then eventually we said, mom, you're crazy. It's not the cold that gives you the flu. It's, you know, the flu virus. And then the reason why it occurs in seasonalities is because during, uh, you know, winter, everybody gets together and huddles together because it's warm and that there's just increased transmission. Well, it turns out your mother was probably at least partly right after all. So they did a study that looked at the transmission of influenza virus uh, in different scenarios of relative humidity and temperature. And it turns out that the temperature and humidity actually do have an effect on influenza. You can't get flu from nothing, okay, just because it's cold, but it increases the transmissibility of the virus substantially. So during the winter, it's usually uh, very cold, and it's also, and most of the time when it's not raining, it's actually much drier than in other seasons. Uh, you know, especially in places that aren't around here. So the authors looked at guinea pigs and they found that transmission was greatest of the flu virus at uh, low temperature and low humidity. So it's mostly that the conditions uh, in the winter months tend to favor the transmission of the organism and also a contribution from people kind of spending more time indoors. Um, the other thing I loved about the study was this illustration they had of their guinea pigs. Uh, and I just love that the guinea pigs have these horrible red eyes. Like, can you imagine, like, if you were in the lab with these guinea pigs? Looks like they'd eat you. Okay, so we, we're talking about the flu, and we talked about how horrible the pandemic or uh, avian influence was, but how bad is the flu flu? Can you, you can die of the regular flu, and yes, you can. Okay. You can have a primary influenza pneumonia. So influenza spreads from essentially being an infection of your upper respiratory tract to being one of your lungs. What's actually probably even more common as a cause of complication and death is what we call a secondary bacterial pneumonia. Essentially, the influenza kind of stuns your immune system, and the bacteria that just sort of hang out on your body, all of a sudden, they're no longer kind of controlled by your immune system and kept in their place, and so they cause essentially an opportunistic infection. And so one thing that's not uncommon is to see patients get the flu, start to get a little bit better, and then they get a big pneumonia on top of that. And it's thought that in many cases that's due to bacteria sort of taking advantage of the situation. One thing that the flu can also lead to is just exacerbations of regular problems, uh, of other medical problems. So say you have heart failure or you have bad asthma. Uh, the flu can exacerbate those conditions such that you might actually die or be hospitalized for that condition, but the flu contributed to it. 
So who is at most at risk of these complications? So again, the general story of influenza when it's not pandemic time is that the very young and the very old are, those, are the ones at risk. Pregnant women are also at risk, and then people with these chronic medical conditions. So asthma, diabetes, heart failure, lung disease, kidney disease, those are the people who are more likely to, if they get the flu, have adverse effects from it. So what can you do to reduce your risk? So again, general infection control, wash your hands with soap and water, okay? and get vaccinated, okay? So even if it's not a perfect match, you do get protection from circulating seasonal uh, influenza from the strains. You can get uh, vaccinations almost anywhere nowadays. So a lot of pharmacies are providing vaccinations, certainly at your doctor's office. Um, they're uh, starting them up places like Walmart. So there will be a lot of opportunity to get vaccinated. Again, hoping that you know for a given year that they don't lead to, uh, they don't end up with a shortage, which occasionally happens. So the populations in which it's strongly recommended, and as you pointed out, this just changed, okay? Not in time for me to update my slides, but um, children six to 59 months, but this is now actually recommended for all children, essentially less than 18, I think is a recommendation, as well as pregnant women, the people that we talked about with those chronic diseases, nursing home residents, and then all adults that are greater than 50, or people who care for or are family to these people, because if these people, even if they're healthy, get sick, they can give it to these people. Finally, healthcare workers, okay? So these are the people that the efforts are made to push these people to get vaccinated. But anyone who wants to reduce the risk of influenza uh, is a candidate for the vaccine. So no one, unless you have an absolute reason not to take it, you won't be turned away for vaccine unless it's a year where there's a shortage, in which case these people will be prioritized, okay? And you may essentially be put off. But in most cases, we end up getting enough vaccine, but people get delayed. So one thing that can be confusing to people is that, you know, what, what are some of the properties of the flu vaccine? And now there's actually a couple different kinds of flu vaccines. So what are some of the similarities and differences? So the two main uh, types of flu vaccine are what we call the inactivated flu vaccine. And this is the flu shot. This is you go to the clinic and they stick the needle in your arm, okay, and it hurts for a couple days or whatever. And this is a killed virus, okay? So they take the virus, they do things to it, it's dead. If you get it, this kind of immunization, you cannot get the flu, okay? You're not gonna get the flu from a flu vaccine. I know that people say that, well, I got the vaccine and then I got the flu. One thing that happens is that the protection from the flu vaccine is not immediate. So there's a window of probably at least two to three weeks during which the vaccine sort of hasn't kicked in. So some people who've gotten the flu vaccine do get the flu but it's just because they haven't had in time to get protected. The other thing is that the vaccine's not 100% effective. People still do get the flu if they get the flu vaccine, but even in the people who get the flu if they've been vaccinated, typically the symptoms are less and the medical complications are less. Um, it's indicated for the prevention of influenza for kids that are in six months. It's a single intramuscular injection in adults, okay? Uh, in kids, it's actually two injections is what's recommended. Contraindications, so why would you not get the vaccine? So we said that anybody you know, who wants it should be able to get this vaccination, okay? One is, that, like I talked about before, the virus is actually grown up and cultivated in eggs. So if you have a huge egg allergy, so not just like it upset your stomachs, but like your throat swells up and you can't breathe when you get eggs, you should not get the flu vaccine because there's a risk that you could react that way. If you are in the middle of a moderate to severe illness, especially a febrile illness, it's recommended that you defer getting the vaccine. Okay. If you get the vaccine, it won't necessarily hurt you. It's just that your body may not essentially respond the way it should and give you immunity because it's kind of busy doing its other thing. So if you're in the middle of like a really bad cold or something like that and you've had a fever, probably not the best time to get vaccinated, best to wait a while, just because that way you'll have the best chance of actually getting a good response. What are the adverse effects? So certainly there's vaccination site soreness. And some of the issues about people thinking that the flu vaccine can cause the flu is that in some patients it does cause sort of a fever and a malaise for a couple of days. And that's the immune system sort of recognizing uh, the components of the killed virus and going after it, which is what you want. But as it does that, it can cause some side effects. So this is the flu shot. This is sort of what um, we consider the standard and what's been uh, offered for a number of years, but there's a new option. And this is what we call the live attenuated vaccine. And it has a brand name, it's called Flumist, okay? As opposed to being a shot, this is actually a nasal spray, okay? But one of the differences is this is not a killed virus. So this is not a virus that's 
dead. What it is is it's a live attenuated virus is what we call it. So it's a virus that's been weakened substantially, okay? but it's still there, it still replicates. It's not necessarily a cause for concern. A lot of the vaccines that we use use live attenuated viruses. So measles, mumps, those are living organisms, okay? not just parts of organisms, okay? but they've been, uh, their pathogenicity has been reduced. Okay. Uh, it's indicated for the prevention of influenza um, for a more narrow range of people than the flu shot. So the flu shot is essentially for everybody. Currently, the flu mist, the nasal, is only for healthy people and healthy non-pregnant people within that range. That's just because that's what has been studied for in terms of safety and efficacy. It might be in a few years that you know, the flu mist is available to or recommended for a broader uh, range of people. What's the dose? You get a squirt in each nostril. Uh, kids need to get uh, multiple doses. It's also made in eggs. One thing that can be a contraindication for this vaccine, but not for the flu shot, is that since it is a live virus, if you have a patient who has a very compromised immune system, so a patient with advanced stage AIDS, a patient who has uh, an organ transplant, those people you actually don't want to give this vaccine to because there's a remote possibility that this virus, even though it's weakened, could replicate and cause disease. Uh, and then again, the same issues in terms of getting uh, vaccinated. And then side effects are usually uh, mild and uh, of a respiratory nature. So, you know, kids hate getting the flu shot. And so that's part of the reason that the flu mist has come around. And so, you know, the flu mist ad, it's this almost tranquilized looking kid. And, you know, that it's administered through something that looks like a needle, but it just gets stuck up your nose and they squirt it there. Okay, and um, in the pharmacy school, we, uh, we train our students to do vaccinations and we do it on ourselves. And this is not what it looks like when you're getting one of these things. So it's actually much more like this, okay? It's actually pretty unpleasant because, I mean, it's not bad, but it's not, you know, definitely not this kid type of reaction. Because it, it, when you uh, administer it, you have to put a lot of pressure because you want it to create a spray, like an aerosol, you know, like if you're pumping perfume or something like that. And so there's a large amount of pressure that's behind it, and you're supposed to stick this thing pretty far up your nose. So when you actually deliver it, it's like, whoa, okay. So it's definitely, you know, less painful than, than a flu shot, but I don't want you to walk away with the idea that it's, you know, that it's this, that it's like, oh, it's so wonderful. I love getting my vaccine. Okay, so what can you do if you get the flu? So again, our, what our preference is, is vaccination, prevent people from getting influenza, but that's not gonna work all the time or not everybody uh, is gonna get vaccinated. So what happens if you do get the flu? There are some options that you can use to reduce your symptoms and maybe to reduce the risk that you'll have severe complications. And there are two drugs that are currently on the market one is called Zanamivir, and the brand name is Relenza. The characteristic of this drug is it's actually an inhaler. Okay, so it's uh, not a pill, but it's a drug that you inhale. Okay, it's a dry powder one, so it's actually a little bit different than even from an asthma inhaler. Um, it's indicated for uh, treatment of uncomplicated influenza and also to prevent influenza. So there are some people who, for one reason or another, can't get the vaccine, or they get vaccinated, but uh, they're at high risk for influenza in that two to three weeks before the flu, before the vaccine kicks in. And so you can put people on these antiviral drugs to prevent them from actually getting the flu. The dose is two inhalations twice a day for five days. I'm not sure if you guys remember, but when this drug was initially introduced, they had the guy from Newman from Seinfeld, and he was dressed up as the flu, and he came around and uh, was annoying people. Um, and actually, the FDA made them pull that ad because he was uh, essentially overstepping what the benefits of the flu, uh, the, this particular drug were. Um, because the benefits of the drug are, what's, what it's been shown to do, is to reduce your symptoms by one to two days compared to placebo. So if you take the drug, the duration of your symptoms will last, will end usually a couple days earlier, and there may be some reduction in your amount of symptoms. But it's not like you start this drug and your flu completely goes away, okay? The other thing about these drugs is that they have a benefit if they're started within the first 48 hours of symptoms, okay? After that, essentially the, the flu virus has taken hold, your immune system's had its reaction. Giving these drugs doesn't really have a benefit. So one of the practical limitations of it is that these drugs are by prescription only. So you gotta figure out some way to get in to see your doctor, have him write you a script, get to the pharmacy within the first 48 hours during a time where you feel lousy, okay? Right, exactly. So, you know, 
So the, the drugs do work. And what is even more promising about them is that they do reduce the symptoms, which is great, but there is a potential reduction in the complications and death. So if you're a person who's at particularly high risk, you may need to, uh, you may consider getting one of these um, drug tr treatments if you, uh, if you actually do come down with the flu. This isn't proven to the same extent. The trials weren't designed that way, but we think that's what may happen. There's another drug, which is a pill, uh, which is Oseltamivir or Tamiflu. And again, you take that twice daily for five days, and it has its own celebrity shill. They had uh, the penguins from that Happy Feet movie. I don't know if you remember. They, that ad's um, all about uh, promoting Tamiflu using these penguins, which, again, seemed a little bit um, odd. And they were all, uh, I saw them like in the San Francisco airport and all that. So a little bit unusual. But they do have options if you get the flu. There are actually some older um, antiviral drugs that you can use to treat the flu. They're not currently recommended because the virus strains that's going around actually have resistance to them. It's possible that someday in the future, if that resistance goes away, there, we may have some different options for the flu, but those drugs weren't really good anyway. Okay. Andrew so, Speaker is asking next. for forgiveness. In an interview airing later this morning on Good Morning America, the man at the center of an international tuberculosis scare tells ABC's Diane Sawyer he is sorry to the airline passengers whom he may have endangered. The way uh, he's being shown and uh, spoken about on TV, it's like a terrorist traveling around the, the world, escaping authorities. Uh, this is blown out of proportion immensely. Andrew Speaker is in isolation at a Colorado hospital being treated for a rare and deadly form of TB. Border agents were told to detain Speaker if he tried to re-enter the U.S. The inspector who let him in at the Canadian border has been taken off duty and the Homeland Security Department has launched an investigation. Doctors say Speaker shows no symptoms of the disease, but his recovery will likely be lengthy and very expensive. It could take months and cost more than a quarter of a million dollars. Yanji Denise, ABC News, Washington. So you guys remember this story? This is the, uh, the lawyer that uh, was supposedly infected with this um, highly resistant form of tuberculosis. And so the term for it is extensively drug resistant tuberculosis, or the abbreviation is XDRTB. And he had been in Italy, and then he, you know, uh, was supposed to come back to the United States, and he had been advised not to come back, and he sort of flew in through Canada and slipped past our uh, border guard anyway. Uh, and so this raised the, you know, the issues of you know, uh, tuberculosis and the risk that resistant tuberculosis poses. It actually turned out that he did not have the most resistant form of tuberculosis like it was presumed. He had a resistant form that was not great to have, but it was not sort of the nightmare scenario. Um, but, you know, tuberculosis is something that's not usually part of our consciousness, and this episode kind of reintroduced it. You know, do people really still get TB? I mean, I don't know, the last, last, last time people remember hearing about TB is when, you know, Val Kilmer died of it in uh, that movie. Uh, and, you know, normally you associate TB with sanitariums, sort of these old school, you know, tuberculosis is something from back in the day. Um, but it really still is an important issue, uh, especially globally. So this is an illustration of sort of tuberculosis in the world. Uh, the, it's essentially a heat map of where tuberculosis shows up. And you can see that really the main effects of tuberculosis, sub-Saharan Africa, but also quite a bit in Asia, whereas the United States and most of Europe, although there's still a fair amount in Europe, uh, are relatively spared. Now, what's important, one thing that's important to consider when you're talking about TB is to get sort of some of the definitions right. So it turns out that actually about a third of the world's population is infected with TB. But that doesn't mean that they're all going around coughing on each other and spreading TB. Most of those people have what we call latent TB. They're infected with the bacterium that causes tuberculosis, but it's not actually causing disease in them. And as long as it's not causing active disease, it can't be spread from one person to another. Okay. So a third of the population is infected. Most of those people have what we call latent TB. However, a certain proportion of those people every year are going to go from having latent TB to having active TB. They're going to be at risk of death, and they're going to be at risk of spreading it to other people.
Okay, so treatment of tuberculosis, it's spread by the air. Risk is associated with a prolonged duration of exposure. So just being, you know, on the same plane with that guy didn't necessarily mean you were going to get TB. You were more likely to get TB if you're his wife, right, if you spend more time around. Because of the growth characteristics and the fact that TB can mutate very quickly, treatment of tuberculosis disease requires combination therapy for months to cure. So you've got to treat people with multiple drugs, and you've got to treat them for a long time. And the reason why this occurs is so you have a whole bunch of these little TB bacteria, and just within that group of bacteria, one of them can spontaneously become resistant to, for example, one of the drugs they use. So here is an I for a drug we'd, we'd use called INH. Okay? So it's just that when you have enough bacteria, one of them is going to just become resistant by chance. If you use a single drug, then what happens is you kill off all the susceptible bacteria, but you leave just enough of those resistant bacteria so that those resistant bacteria then multiply. And now all of the bacteria have this resistance. And if you say, well, okay, I'm just going to treat with a different drug. Well, now that you have all these organisms that are resistant to one drug, within that population, one of them can spontaneously become resistant to a second drug. And so now you have an organism that's resistant to two drugs. And if you use a second drug in series, one after the other, what you just end up is selecting for more and more resistance. Okay, so to get around this problem, this, which is a problem especially with TB, we use multiple drugs combined with a, for, to treat patients. So at least two drugs, but in most cases more than that. Unfortunately, the fact you have to use multiple drugs for a prolonged period of time means that patients oftentimes don't adhere to their regimen. Okay? They can't take all these drugs for all the, you know, I mean, it's enough of a problem, you know, taking your vitamins in the morning, okay? And adherence is a general issue, but can you imagine taking four drugs for months at a time, especially if you live in an area where there aren't a whole lot of economic resources? So these are our primary anti-TB drugs. So a standard regimen, sort of best case scenario, would be to take these four drugs for two months, and then and again, the best case scenario, you can stop these two drugs at two months and take these two drugs for four months. So a total of six months, you spend six months on these drugs and maybe only two months on these. So part of it is that t uh, tuberculosis tends to divide very slowly. And the drugs that we use tend to act best on bacteria that are dividing. And so because the, the TB sort of grows very, very slowly, it takes actually a long time to also to kill it. One thing you'll notice about these are our anti-tuberculosis drugs is that they're all pretty darn old, right? So the years they were first marketed, years and years, so 50s, 60s, 70s, okay? And even all alternative drugs, most of them are old. So again, because TB has been, you know, primarily not a disease of the developed world, there has not been a lot of incentive to develop new TB drugs. And so, you know, the most recent drugs that we've used to treat TB, uh, you know, are 20 years old. And following the regimen is critical. If you don't believe me, believe the voice of Brad Pitt. As the drugs start killing the germs, many people begin to feel better and stop taking their pills. But a few germs are naturally resistant to the antibiotics. These survive, quickly multiply, and become the majority. Now, if patients restart their medicines, these resistant bacteria become tougher to kill. After an explosion of antibiotics discovered in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, the faucet is running dry. Of the hundreds of drugs currently under government review, only a handful are for bacterial infections. And that's bad news for the public. You know, in fact, I think they should be terrified. <laughs> Hopefully you're terrified. Um, so. You know, why is this problem? Why are we worried about having more different drugs for tuberculosis? Well, the amount of resistant tuberculosis that's in the world is increasing. So this is just an example. And the primary reason I want to put it here is not for the numbers, because these numbers are actually somewhat exaggerated. These numbers would suggest that one-third of all of the TB infections in industrialized nations are resistant. So in this case, we would call it MDR. And this, these numbers are exaggerated because usually uh, they only test uh, these, a lot of these um, strains of TB if they are worried that there's a problem. Okay. So this maybe under overrepresents the total amount of resistance. But what I want to illustrate with this is that you have what's called multi-drug resistance, 
which is resistance to two of these primary drugs that we talked about in that table, okay, so isoniazid, rifampin, et cetera. And then you can have, again, what we considered XDR, which is multi-drug resistance plus resistance to the alternative drugs. So these XDR strains are not just resistance to the drugs we like to use first line, but they're also resistant to our second line drugs and our backup drugs. So what are the consequences of extre you know, extremely drug resistant tuberculosis? Well, instead of six months, which is already a long time, you need to start treating people for a year or more. You need to use injectable rather than oral drugs. So can you imagine having to come into a clinic every day for 18 months to get a drug be uh, uh, intravenously, and the risk of death essentially almost doubles relative to uh, patients who don't have resistant TB. And so... The problem is, the few drugs that cure MDR-TB are highly toxic and cause dangerous side effects. Rarely used, they are so expensive, the Peruvian government can't afford them. The price of treating MDR patients was so high, it was impossible for us. It was not only an economic problem, the treatment was too complex and difficult to manage. We couldn't justify the investment. You remember they said the lawyer, you know, his case Even of XDR TB could have cost $250,000 to treat. In the 1990s, and that's just not realistic the official for a lot of countries around the globe problem. is to treat those with curable TB and let MDR victims die. So what can you do? You know, hopefully you never have to experience, you know, XDR or any kind of TB. But it's important to be informed, especially when things, cases like this hit the news media. One thing is to support charitable efforts to develop new drugs and vaccines. So there's a global alliance for vaccines and immunizations. Uh, another leader in uh, tuberculosis control is the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. If you're exposed to someone with TB, which happens every once in a while, get tested. So go to your doctor. There's tests they can do to see whether or not, if you've been exposed, whether you develop uh, an infection. And again, most of those infections, you'll never end up developing active disease, but there's drugs that you can take that would prevent you from ever developing active disease. And don't necessarily avoid travel just because of TB. Again, for the most part, you need prolonged exposure to get TB. It's not a guarantee, but for the most part, it's spread between people who have close contact with each other. Okay, so which is a bigger threat to you? The globe-trotting TB-infected lawyer or the cute baby? And I'm sure you're going to wonder how I'm going to end up justifying the cute baby. Bring me the ball. Bryce Smith has lived through big ups and downs in his young life. Just weeks ago, his parents didn't know if their first child would survive. But the 17-month-old bounced back after a life-threatening infection. You just look at him and sometimes I get all teary-eyed. Who's that? <laughs> Say, Tigger. Katie and Scott Smith worried when Bryce's first cold last Christmas left him listless and gasping for air. Despite their doctor's reassurance that everything was okay, they rushed Bryce to Children's Hospital on New Year's Eve. They were shocked to learn his tiny body was battling pneumonia. When the bacteria gets inside the body and causes infection, antibiotics have traditionally knocked it down. But an overuse of antibiotics has allowed the bacteria to adapt or become resistant. You might get treated with these antibiotics over and over for some repeated viral infection and then you develop this resistance. Then when you get very sick, some later level, uh, you can't be cured by the antibiotics that we would traditionally use and we kind of start to run out of options. In our problem with antibiotic resistance is either prescribing an antibiotic when it's not indicated, so people get too much exposure to too many antibiotics. People taking other people's antibiotics is a huge issue. People say, oh, I might, took my brother's you know, leftover penicillin because I had a sore throat and I thought it might be strep throat. Lowe says antibiotics only help a bacterial infection but are often taken for viruses which have similar symptoms. That can cause unwanted side effects and render the drugs useless when they're really needed. 
Lowe says doctors need to be more cautious about prescribing antibiotics and when possible take a culture to test for bacteria. Lowe stresses patients need to follow their doctor's orders. As it is, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention says up to 50 percent of all antibiotic use is unnecessary. We are in a world where we just kind of expect that if you get pneumonia, if you get an infection, the worst thing that'll happen is you'll be in the hospital and you'll have to get some kind of really strong antibiotic, but then you'll be okay. And what we're looking at is a world where there are going to be some infections where we just don't have the drug to fight it off. No one understands that better than the Smiths. I'm gonna go. <laughs> the Santee couple values the life-saving abilities of antibiotics more than ever. Bryce is very lucky to be here, um, very lucky. The next round of people, it's not going to be because it's becoming so resistant and if they don't start researching and trying to come up with new drugs to fight this bacteria, it's going to be a really bad situation. Okay, so what are we concerned about here? Okay, so the organism that we're concerned about here that's causing all these horrible things for this kid isn't something as exotic as extensively drug resistance tuberculosis, but it's an organism called Streptococcus pneumonia, okay, also known as Strep pneumo or the pneumococcus. And this is actually one of those organisms that normally inhabits your upper respiratory tract. However, even the fact, you know, even given the fact that it's something that lives with us, it's still the leading cause of pneumonia, it's the leading cause of meningitis, it's a leading cause of people who have chronic bronchitis when they have episodes where they get worse. It's the first or second cause. It's a, one of the leading causes of sinus infections and the leading cause of ear infections in children. And you can see that combined influenza and pneumonia, which is lumping a bunch of things together, but it's what the CDC does, is one of the leading causes of death in the United States. So if it's normal flora, so like I said, you know, you have these bacteria that are all over you all the time. Why doesn't it play nice? Why is it causing a problem? And one of the issues is this idea of opportunism or sort of breaking down of barriers. So one where you often see this infection is after a, a viral infection comes, weakens the immune system, and causes issues with sort of the normal way your body functions. For example, what often occurs During in patients who have sinus infections the is the following. Inside the bones of the skull are air pockets called sinuses. The four major sinuses that drain into the nose and throat are the frontal, maxillary, ethmoid, and sphenoid. Sometimes foreign particles get past the cilia of the nose and enter one of the four sinus cavities. The sinuses are also equipped with cilia that push mucus and particles out of the sinus cavities. So normally your sinuses work to get stuff the out of there. sinuses drain into the nose through a hairpin-shaped tube called the ostium. If the cilia are unable to push the mucus through the ostium, mucus can collect in the sinuses, blocking the pathways and causing... So this can occur when you get a viral infection the like the cold. A condition called sinusitis. Sinusitis often develops following an upper respiratory infection or allergic reaction. Symptoms of sinusitis can include facial pain or pressure. So because you can't drain all this fluid discharge because of your cold, over the counter you develop and an infection. Can help alleviate so that's commonly of one way in which However, this organism, which normally hangs out surgery. in your respiratory tract, causes an infection is because it's normal mechanisms for your body to deal with it, to drain it, etc., are compromised. One issue that's a particular concern that was illustrated was the idea of drug resistance. Okay, so these are some of the common antibiotics that we use to treat. Um, these infections and resistance is increasing for many of them. We still have some drugs that are good, okay, but even in those, resistance is increasing. If you get a resistant infection, what does that mean? People who are infected with resistant organisms have a greater mortality, they're more likely to fail therapy, okay, they're more likely to have prolonged symptoms, okay, be hospitalized, etc. So it's not a good thing to get infected with one of these resistant organisms. Where does resistance come from? How does it originate? So this is a graph that looks at some of the common respiratory tract infections that we have in the United States and the estimates of how many times there are physician visits. And this is the percentage of those visits that resulted in antibiotic prescription. And what you can see is actually, over time, there's less prescribing of antibiotics for some of these. Okay. But you had heard before about, you know, the CDC estimates that, you know, 50% of antibiotic prescribing is inappropriate. Well, why is that? It's because for most of these conditions, 
there's minimal to no benefit to antibiotics, okay? Partly because most of the time, a lot of these conditions are caused by viruses. And antibiotics, when we say antibiotics, we usually mean antibacterial drugs, okay, are target bacteria, not viruses, okay? But one thing you could say is, well, antibiotics do prevent complications of infection, right? So maybe, you know, what I'm really worried about is that I'm gonna develop a secondary bacterial infection, even though, you know, I might just have the common cold. Well, it's actually true that there may be some benefit to antibiotics to prevent those complications. But the issue is, what's the degree of benefit, okay? And how frequently are these complications gonna occur? So this is from a study that said, looks at your odds ratio, which is similar to like your reduction in, in risk. So getting antibiotics for these conditions, this is like a common cold, this is a ear infection, and this is a sore throat, and these are complications like pneumonia, this is an infection of your uh, bones, and this is uh, like uh, an abscess. Getting antibiotics reduces your risk, but this number is important, the number needed to treat. This would be the number of people that you would need to treat with antibiotics to prevent one case of this from occurring. Okay. So even though there's a benefit, you'd need to treat 4,000 people with antibiotics to prevent one case of pneumonia in somebody who had the common cold. One thing to contrast that with is the consequences. So say you were giving these people a penicillin or a penicillin-based drug. About 10% of the population, anywhere from 1% to 10%, has some sort of penicillin allergy. So the number needed to treat to harm, the number of people you'd treat to have a bad thing occur is only 10 to 100. Anaphylaxis, which is one of the, is a severe reaction to penicillin, which can be life-threatening, occurs in about 0.01 to 1%. So the number needed to treat to harm is near the same uh, magnitude as this here. So your risk of getting penicillin anaphylaxis is about the same as your risk of getting a benefit from uh, these antibiotics uh, in terms of preventing these complications, okay? And even your risk of death, although it's still, it's an order of magnitude almost higher, is still not, um, uh, not negligible. Whereas the other complication for getting antibiotics is the pr uh, probability that you're gonna res develop resistance. That the next time you develop an infection, that it's gonna be with a resistant organism. So 17% of the people who didn't get antibiotics during this, in this one study, had a resistant, a penicillin resistant organism compared to 57% of people who'd gotten an antibiotic in the last six months. So the number needed to treat to harm here is three. Okay? So if you treat three people with antibiotics who don't need it, okay, one of them is gonna end up getting a drug resistant infection, like we talked about, that has some consequences. So what does this have to do with kids? Well, uh, are kids little angels? Are they cauldrons of contagion. So kids are much more likely to have this strep pneumo uh, in their respiratory tract, okay? So 55% of three-year-olds carry it around compared to just 8% of adults. This is persistent carriage. Kids, as you guys know, have frequent infections. So most kids have uh, an ear infection by their first year, and most kids, uh, and, and a lot of them have multiple episodes, and in the U.S., most of these kids get antibiotics, okay? So kids see a lot of antibiotics from a young age, and they also tend to spread infection easily, right? So they're all running around in daycare together, they're all snotty and wiping their hands and fighting over things. And so they spread the infections to each other and then they come home and spread the infections to adults. And the concern is that because they're exposed to a lot of antibiotics, they may be spreading around drug resistance. So what can you do? Uh, you can definitely educate yourself about some of the issues about antibiotic resistance. There are a couple of good websites uh, from the CDC and from another organization. So getting your flu shot. So again, we talked about the idea that there are these secondary bacterial infections. Okay, so if you get the flu, you're more likely to get one of these other bacterial infections. So preventing yourself from getting the flu can prevent these infections. We'll talk about, just uh, to, to finish up, this idea of, of there's a vaccine against this organism, streptococcus pneumoniae. So if it's something that you qualify for, you should consider getting that vaccine. And you only have to get that like once. You don't have to do that yearly. You should make sure your children are vaccinated. Again, wash your hands, don't spread. And if you are prescribed antibiotics, take them correctly. What are some of the elements of taking antibiotics correctly? Taking it as you're told, not skipping doses, not sharing it, an important one is to finish the whole prescription even if you get better. So after a couple doses, a lot of times people say, well, I, you know, I think my antibiotics are working, I feel great, I'm gonna stop. 
But at that point, you may not have killed off enough of the bacteria, and some of them may re uh, emerge resistance. And don't save it for later. Don't share it with other people. I'm going to talk real quick that basically the idea is that there's um, a, a vaccine that can protect you against streptococcus pneumoniae. There's actually two kinds, but the one that's indicated for adults is this one, the pneumovax. This vaccine is for children. So what's recommended now is that all children less than two years get this vaccine. For adults, and you know, so those of us who didn't get the vaccine when we were really young, which is pretty much everybody, which is everyone in this room, can get the vaccine, this other vaccine, okay, and what's recommended is everybody who's uh, greater than 65, and then everyone who's older than two, who has one of these chronic diseases. And a lot of, we already discussed what some of those chronic diseases are, heart failure, asthma, et cetera. And the benefit of this vaccination is to prevent these severe infections in patients and to reduce the symptoms of more common infections like pneumonia, sinusitis. We've had, uh, okay, and then what can you do, what don't, shouldn't you do? You shouldn't pressure your doctor to get into giving antibiotics for you and your children. Okay, so their CDC has this campaign, snort, sniffle, steez, no antibiotics, please. Um, and it kind of seems ridiculous. So like, well, what does my doctor care? I mean, isn't he going to do you know, the right thing regardless of what I tell him to do? And actually, pressure from patients has a huge impact on physicians. So there was this, this is a survey that looked at you know, the attitudes of physicians towards uh, antibiotic resistance, and they all agreed that antibiotic resistance was a big problem, overprescribing antibiotics is a major cause of resistance, but 80% of them thought that patient demand is the major reason that physicians overprescribe antibiotics. And so even if you don't really see that dynamic, the physicians do. So when patients are demanding antibiotics, the physicians feel compelled to provide them. What I think is really interesting is that although they feel that overprescribing is a major cause of resistance, almost no one thinks that they prescribe antibiotics more than they should. So it's kind of one of these, it's someone's fault, not mine. This is, there's a lot of good resources from those websites that I pointed out at the CDC. Um, so I think it's worth taking a look at there. Uh, and actually there's more material, but you guys have done, have been so interactive that uh, I don't think I'm going to get to it all. So I'd rather uh, kind of stop here uh, and answer any questions anybody has, because we're kind of out of time. Okay, well, great. Thank you very much. Uh, it's been a great uh, interactive session. Thank you.